Okay, good morning. Thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the energy program here at CSIS. We're very pleased to have all of you here today uh, for the World Energy Outlook's 2015 special report on energy and climate change. Um, for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to read the report, it's been out for, uh, I think, a little over a week now. Um, it's a really, really fantastic, uh, as is typical of, of the World Energy Outlook and FATI's team, a fantastic overview of where we stand in terms of the challenge that we are facing uh, for the upcoming uh, Conference of Parties negotiation in Paris at the end of this year. Uh, and as the IEA has tried to do over the last several years, what it does is sort of takes a snapshot of where we stand in terms of the overall climate challenge, but also provide guidance uh, and an approximation of what it would take uh, in the energy system to be able to reach the kind of targets that the international community says it wants to, and provides actually some very interesting guidance uh, for negotiators themselves, both for the, uh, the, the talks themselves uh, and then also uh, what should be done uh, after uh, the, the negotiations and the world after Paris. Uh, so we are really, really pleased to host that conversation here today and uh, have Fatih Barol, uh, the uh, chief economist and incoming executive director of the International Energy Agency here to lead that discussion. Uh, we're also pleased to have with us uh, Dave Turk, who's the deputy assistant secretary for international climate and technology uh, at the U.S. Department of Energy, who spends a lot of his time focusing on um, uh, on, on what the U.S. government is doing uh, in light of uh, 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 to, to deal with sort of international climate efforts, what they're doing to coordinate international clean energy technology efforts. Uh, he's also spent some time on the negotiating team himself, so he's not unfamiliar with what the challenges are. Um, I'm going to invite him up here first uh, to please uh, introduce Fatih and talk a little bit about how they're thinking about the negotiations. Fatih will give a presentation of uh, what the report says, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Today's discussion is absolutely on the record, it's being webcast, uh, so if you could please silence your cell phones, uh, and then when we're doing the Q&A, uh, wait for the microphone so that our, uh, it, our audience not physically here can participate. Um, so without further ado, please, uh, Dave Turk. Well, thank you, uh, Sarah, and thanks for CSI as hosting this meeting, and thank you all for coming out, especially on a Friday morning. I think this is an impressive signal of Fatih's star power to get this many folks in Washington in June to come out to a meeting uh, on, at 9 o'clock um, on Friday. So thanks for everybody um, coming. Um, and thinking about how to introduce um, Fatih, um, I went back to the statement that um, Secretary Moniz, my boss, who very much wished he could be here today, but he uh, was on a plane last night going to uh, Vienna to, and, and uh, participate in some important negotiations. So he sends his best um, Fatih. Um, but he put out a statement, Secretary Moniz put out a statement when Fatih not too long ago was announced as the new executive director of the, uh, the IEA. And there was something in that statement that caught my eye, which I think is um, exactly the right way to introduce um, Fatih. And that is that the secretary said that he was the ideal candidate to take over the IEA at this point in time. And that's the kind of um, language you don't usually see in statements. Um, in terms of people taking over new positions. Usually it's they're a terrific leader, they're a terrific this or that. But ideal is a very strong word. But I think in this instance it fits um, perfectly in terms of the challenges that the IEA is facing and the importance of the IEA. I'd also say that certainly from the U.S. perspective and Secretary Moniz and the rest of the U.S. government, the IEA is in a, a very incredibly important part of the international architecture when it comes to energy, when it comes to um, energy and climate change, and that nexus something Fatih has spent many, many years on. Uh, Secretary Moniz agreed to chair the uh, IEA ministerial meeting that will take place in November of this year, just a few weeks right before the Paris COP in Paris. So there will be, a, a, I think, a quite strong connection to the negotiations in the sense of energy ministers from around the world coming together to um, show some um, foundation of innovation and technology and price reductions, a lot of the things um, the WIO report gets into as well. Um, but Secretary Moniz chairing that meeting is just one signal of how important the U.S. considers the IEA, um, both what it's been able to do in the past, but frankly going forward in terms of its importance in the world that, uh, the world that we all live in. So let me just break down the word ideal. Why do I think and agree with my boss, as everybody always should agree with their boss when they um, say something along those lines. What, what is it about Fatih that makes him the ideal leader of the IEA uh, at this point in time? 
First, of course, is the normal kinds of things you see in his bio or his resume, um, different background experiences, whether his academic background, um, his years at the IEA as chief economist, um, founding um, and chairing the IEA Energy Business Council, um, chairman of the World Ener Economic Forum's um, Energy Advisory Board, um, a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Group on Sustainable Energy, a whole series of awards from countries, um, some of their top awards that they've offered. It's just an incredibly impressive um, background and experience set. He's also um, incredibly dedicated and tireless for those who have gotten to know Fatih over the years. Just one data point on that. The week preceding this, Fatih was in um, all an official business, at least I think it was all official business. Um, Monday he was in the, the, the UK, on Tuesday he was in Brussels, on Wednesday he was in Ireland, on Thursday he was in Copenhagen, on Friday he was in Germany, and then he decided to keep working, um, and on Saturday he was in the Slovak Republic. So obviously for those who do a lot of flying, just thinking about that makes me tired, um, but it's just uh, one data point on how dedicated and tireless he is and passionate about, um, about what he does. Third, and I think this is incredibly important, especially at this point in time, he's someone at least that I've found who really enjoys what he's doing. And um, that's important for a leader, certainly a leader like an, for an organization, IEA, but also a leader in the global community for someone who's passionate about what they do, looks forward to working every day, um, and that I think rubs off on everybody around them. I know certainly that's the feeling we get from the, the United, States, United States side of things. That leads towards him being not only a terrific leader, but also a diplomat, and that's something that's going to be incredibly important as the IEA um, goes forward. He's also a strategic thinker and a top-notch um, analyst, and there's a clarity of thought that, for those who've not heard Fatih speak before and looked at some of his work, I think you'll see that today. There's a clarity of thought and an ability to cut through the background noise and really focus on the, uh, the essentials. So that brings me to the um, reason we're all here today and um, the report, the WEO Special Report on Energy and Climate. Um, let me just say a few things about that. One, there's a lot of reports, analysis, presentations going on this year, as Sarah said, in the lead up to the uh, Conference of the Parties in Paris in December, the um, big opportunity to get a global agreement. Um, I would say if you don't read anything else, this is the one report to read. Um, I think it's got a clarity of thought and analysis. I think a lot of that comes from Fatih, but um, also from his team at IEA, which is an incredibly uh, dedicated team. We're also um, graced by the new Deputy Executive Director, Paul, who's sitting in the front as well, who will be an incredibly important part of the, uh, the IEA team and some other um, top leaders of, of IEA. So there's a clarity of analysis and thought in, in this report. It's also meaty, there's a lot in there. It's not that thick of a report, unlike some of the other IEA reports that come out there. You can actually carry it and not have, not have your, arm, your arm get tired. Um, but there's, there's a, lot, a lot in there. Um, it's also, I think, guaranteed to make you think. There's a lot of reports that go out there and it's just sort of the same stuff you've seen and heard previously and it, it's just um, kind of stale, if you will. But I think this is one, at least, that made me think and I think it will, will do the same for others as well. It's also very real world focused, um, real world oriented. Um, with that, it's also specific and actionable. So I think that's enough said for me. Let's um, get on to Fatih. Happy to answer questions at the end, but it's just terrific, Fatih, to have you in Washington. Um, terrific to um, have this report out there. I think it's an incredibly important contribution in this critical year. Um, and even more so, um, it's terrific to have you leading IEA going forward very soon, and Paul and others um, in the IEA leadership team. And, uh, from the United States, we look forward to working with you. And thanks for coming. So, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a great pleasure to come back to Washington, but also to CSIS. Uh, this is uh, a great uh, uh, pleasure. I, uh, as I told uh, Sarah and uh, uh, Frank, I always feel at home. So you don't have the uh, the uh, the challenge of speaking outside of the uh, home because I feel at home here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this report is an 
specifically on energy and climate change, but we will have our uh, World Energy Outlook, the, uh, the very big book, uh, the door one of those door stoppers uh, coming in November, and uh, Frank kindly uh, gave me a green light that I could still, again, have an opportunity to share the results of that uh, report uh, with you, which will look, among other things, the, uh, what will happen if the low oil prices with us for many years to come for the global energy sector, not only for oil, but gas, renewables, nuclear, and the positioning of different uh, countries uh, in the world. We will have a special focus on India and many other things, and I will be very happy to come and talk to you uh, on uh, that uh, book sometime towards the end of uh, this uh, year. Many thanks to Dave for it is very, very uh, kind, very generous uh, words. I am very much looking forward to start uh, my work as of uh, 1st of uh, September. And uh, if uh, I was considered to be successful in the last 20 years, in, I'm, it's 21 year I am in the IEA, it is mainly because I was able to, I believe, build a very good team. I am a man, I, I, my, uh, some of the colleagues know here very well, my, Second biggest passion is uh, football, the soccer, so as, as you call it. Uh, and my philosophy, working philosophy comes from there. You have to believe the team work. So therefore, uh, it is extremely important that uh, we build a very good team and play collectively as a team, rather than a one man, one uh, person uh, show. In that respect, uh, uh, Dave briefly mentioned I am uh, very, very much looking forward to uh, Paul Simons. He is somewhere uh, here, I, I guess. He's all, all, all here, just in the front door. Uh, Paul is going to join uh, in a few weeks of time uh, to IEA as my uh, deputy, and I am very much looking forward to work with Paul. For the colleagues who didn't know, Paul was already uh, working with the IEA, in the IEA Secretariat, as the chair of one of our major committees uh, who looks at the policy issues uh, more than four years, if I am not wrong, uh, uh, Paul, and he has been ambassador to Chile. He has a lot of experience in policy making. I am very much looking forward to work with uh, uh, Paul uh, in a few weeks of time and uh, for a longer period. Again, I am very happy, another uh, member of the IEA team, it is uh, Lazlo Varo. Lazlo was also here yesterday giving, uh, I think, another uh, uh, speech uh, on our uh, gas markets. Lazo is working now. He is the division head for gas uh, column power, and I, I uh, expect that Lazo will play also a much broader role in the uh, IEA uh, work in the next months to come. And finally, I have Mr. Amos Bromhead. Amos uh, worked with me uh, 13 years in the VO team, and uh, he is now uh, going to work. Uh, with me uh, together in the executive office of the uh, IEA and uh, Amos and Noah, we know each other uh, very well, or too well, perhaps I should say, so we uh, almost uh, 13 years working together. And uh, this is definitely uh, the Washington uh, DC, and of course CSS will be one of the, uh, the addresses that we are going to visit uh, a lot. So uh, we made a book, Energy and Climate, first of all, the book is, report is here. It is freely downloadable. Anybody goes to our website can find it. And uh, many people ask us, you are an energy organization. Why are you making a report on climate? Our answer is very uh, simple, as I will tell you in a minute. We, energy is responsible more than two thirds of the emissions. If you cannot find a solution in the energy sector, you cannot, you cannot solve the climate problem, which we believe is an important issue for everybody. Therefore, there is a meeting in Paris at the end of uh, uh, this uh, year, and for that meeting, we are coming. What are the demands of the energy sector to bring more realism to the discussion and uh, more uh, the increase the chances of implementation of the decisions coming from Paris. So we have about six months for that very important meeting in Paris. And uh, we also see that the momentum is building. 
It's a good thing, the political momentum. Uh, we have seen, first of all, uh, last year in uh, November, a historic announcement of uh, President Obama and President Xi about uh, China, US, uh, confirming their determination to come out with a result in uh, Paris, and also EU, which I should say, the champion of, of fighting against climate change since years, have a very firm target. Now, for the first time, we have seen many times uh, the momentum is building, but there, is, there are some differences, and I will outline in, in, in during my speech, so that we know anybody who works on energy cannot afford to follow what is happening in climate policy, and I will try to prove it. Now, one thing is, in the past, we have seen mainly developed industrial countries putting the climate, pushing the climate policies, but now we are seeing many developing countries coming with commitments. This is important for the first time, and I will give you the names of these countries, but to give you the umbrella message, it is not anymore developed countries pushing the agenda, but developing countries are uh, coming uh, along. And energy industry, they are now engaging more and more with the climate change issues. Now, how much, who, this is a question, but I can tell you, if any energy company, whoever you are, if we believe that the climate policies will not affect our businesses, we are wrong. There will be this or that level of effect. It can be oil, because of the efficiency policies, the demand. It can be gas, because of the policies on, on coal. It can be electricity, renewables, and whatever. Climate policies will affect the energy businesses. This, this is uh, happening, and therefore, energy sector is being uh, engaged energy industry with uh, climate change. And as I said, energy is by far the most important sector in terms of the contribution to the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Now, we made this report, of course, but we are very much aware that the energy, while it is associated in this report in main discussions nowadays with climate change, energy is in fact a good thing. It brings comfort, it brings economic growth, it, it brings a modernization, and there are other aspects of energy, such as energy security, such as the access to energy. 1.2 billion people have no access uh, to uh, modern energy services today. And we try to, in this report, bring them all of them together, climate change being the uh, most important part. But if I can say one thing to the climate change negotiation, the leaders going there, any agreement in Paris which does not put the energy at its core risks being a failure from the start. So just uh, uh, mentioning this uh, very fact, which I think is important. Now, there are, as I said, there are some encouraging signs. And one of them is, in addition to political momentum, is about the data. What we see is that last year, for the first time, in the history of 40 years, we have the emissions data in a, in a uh, CO2 emissions data in a, a reliable way. We have seen that the CO2 emissions did not increase when the global economy grew. In the past uh, uh, 40 years, three times before, global emissions did not increase, but there was a recession economy went down. Last year, global economy increased slightly more than 3%, whereas the global emissions remain flat. This is excellent news. This is a very good news. Of course, we do not know it's a one-off or not, it's a structural or not. In my view, it will be difficult to keep it that way for a long time in the absence of new uh, steps. But we look into that, why it is happening. 
it is happening, I mean, there, if I can give three major uh, re reasons. One, renewable energies. We, when we talk about renewables in many countries where oil and gas is important, there is, a, in some cases, there is a smile in the faces. Is it real or not? I'll give you a number. It's not about forecast. Last year, globally, 45% of the new capacity coming in the electricity sector globally was renewables, 45%. The other put coal, oil, gas, nuclear, half, more or less half, the other half is renewables. Made a big inroad renewables, this is one. Second, even more difficult to, uh, uh, to convince many of us, Efficiency policies are uh, now uh, bearing fruit, especially two areas. One, household appliances, like refrigerators, TV sets, uh, air conditioners, and on the transportation sector, cars and slowly trucks. And this, in turn, slows down the oil demand growth and, therefore, CO2 emissions. So this is second renewables and uh, efficiency. These are both globally. In some countries more, some countries less. You can find which country have it is in our report. Third, China and coal. For the first time since over a decade, we have seen Chinese coal consumption declined. We have not seen it before. Every year it increased. And this is one of the major sources of uh, CO2 emission increase. So among others, these three are the main reasons why we have seen such a promising picture that the 2014 emissions were flat. Of course, we need to keep the momentum uh, to see uh, that this trend uh, continues. Now, many of the colleagues here are coming from the, uh, since uh, I had the opportunity to come to CSAS often, I know that many colleagues are not necessarily coming from the climate angle like myself, and to tell them an issue, why it is difficult to find a solution, okay? So since everybody now, almost 194 countries, they all believe that the climate change, their governments, we have to find a solution, why it is difficult. There are some colleagues like uh, Dave who knows this, uh, 100 times better than me, but just to making very simple words. The issue is to see, to identify who is responsible for uh, this challenge today and in the future. Now, first of all, just a typical information. When the carbon goes to atmosphere, it remains this, there a very long period of time. So it means the carbon went to atmosphere uh, 100 years ago, a big chunk of it is still there. Therefore, the hist what happened in the past is very important. As many developing countries say, and as I would say, they have a point in that. When we look at the last 125 years, more than 60% of the emissions came from US and European countries. But when we look at the future, the growth of emissions coming from the emerging countries is extremely impressive. The, only from China, the emissions coming from China with the, without changing their policies is bigger than growth coming from US, all uh, European countries, Japan, Korea, and the others put together. India emerges as an important uh, emitter uh, overtaking uh, Japan, while even in that context, Indians' per capita emissions are one of the lowest. So there are different criteria that different countries look at in order to identify who is responsible, how much, and therefore who should do how much in the future. So the point of departure is not a very straightforward one. It is the thing why it makes it a bit complex, not a bit, it's significantly uh, complex. So therefore, 
What happened is that with a new hope for Paris, all the countries agreed that before the Paris meeting, they are going to commit themselves how much emissions they are going to reduce by 2030. This is called pledges, and in the context of the climate change uh, jargon called uh, INDCs, and every country say, in 2030, I will reduce uh, uh, this much. And when we look at globally today, many countries made those uh, 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 pledges. And once again, it is not only the industrialized world. Ethiopia, Gabon, Morocco, Russia, Mexico, US, Canada, all European countries, they said in 2030, I am going to reduce this much. China and Japan made firm indications how much they are going to reduce their emissions. If you add all of them together, you cover two-thirds of the emissions today have a commitment for Paris. If they uh, push their uh, uh, pledges, if they go uh, through that. So two good news here. One, a big chunk of countries are making emissions. And second, it is not only industrial nations. It's a more of a, a mix uh, there. So we looked, if those commitments countries made officially on behalf of their governments are implemented, what are the implications of those for the energy sector? Does it really matter? Does it affect our businesses? Will it have impact on our policies, the strategies, the outlook, how we see the energy world develop? And the answer is absolutely yes. There will be a material impact on the uh, energy sector. It is the reason why I said, if the companies, the energy uh, uh, experts believe that the climate policies will not affect their businesses, in my view, they may be making a mistake. Let me give you a couple of examples. How those commitments can change the energy world if they are implemented. First of all, in 2030, about 25% of the global energy will come from clean energy technologies. And in my view, more importantly, energy efficiency improvements will accelerate a factor of three compared to past. Currently, it is global energy intensity improvement 0.7 percent. It will be around 2 percent per year. This is very important. If you are a major oil company and if you miss that, you make mistakes because you have to understand how the demand will grow. Second, in terms of renewables, about 60 percent of the all new power plants, the capacity expansion, will come from renewable energies. Only 40% will come from coal plus oil, gas, nuclear, and the others put together. There is a big emphasis on renewables, including, or perhaps even more impressive, in the emerging countries. Leave aside our forecast today, as of today, Renewable energy investments in China are larger than Europe plus US plus Japan put together. This is the investment made today, 2014. And it is solar, it is wind and hydropower. So therefore, we will see a major penetration of renewable uh, energies in the electricity sector. In terms of fossil fuels, Biggest hit comes to coal. Oil will grow, but there will be a slowdown of the oil demand growth. And the natural gas will be the only fuel, fossil fuel, which we will see an increase in this uh, market uh, share. 
it is mainly replacing coal in many uh, aspects. And total coal demand in the OECD world, in the industries will, will get a big hit, while there will be a slowdown in India and China. So as you will see, the, there will be a material impact on the energy sector that we cannot ignore to see. And once again, if those commitments are fulfilled. And what are the implications of those commitments on the climate change? It is, there will be a slowdown of the CO2 emissions, but this is far from universally agreed two degrees Celsius uh, target, uh, which is still not bringing us uh, uh, there. So uh, there's still a big gap between the, what the leaders, world leaders agreed and what will happen because some of those pledges may not be as strong as the, uh, what they should be in order to reach the two degrees Celsius target. So therefore, here comes the uh, IEA. What do we know, what do we want? is the energy sector from Paris. We are uh, about uh, a few hundred meters from the where the meeting will uh, take uh, uh, place. So we thought, since they are neighbors, we should give some suggestions to them. First of all, we as the IEA, we believe in a secure, sustainable uh, energy sector for uh, everybody. And we thought this is an important chance for the energy sector to get clear messages. And also energy sector realism is reflected in the discussion. As the two thirds of the emissions come from the energy sector, we feel responsible for that. So we have four major demands from uh, the uh, Paris Agreement. Number one, global emissions need to peak around 2020 if we want to have any chance to reach our climate goals. If we are not able to do that, then we look at uh, other options, how we can live in a world which is very different than today. But 2020 peak still uh, helps us, and this is the first and the foremost demand of the IEA. Second, these pledges are made, very important, I, I think it will be completely wrong to underestimate these commitments, pledges coming from the countries, but still we think every five years they should be reviewed whether one has to make some adjustments to them. This is the second one, I will come in a moment. Third, currently, universally agreed there is one target, all the world leaders say, two degrees. But we would like to see from the Paris, what does two degrees mean in terms of emission reduction? To see, to have a signal, to see a concrete figure. Two degrees is a, a something to do with the uh, temperature. With the, it is far from the energy sector to make a picture, to give a signal to the investors to make it more, much more concrete. And fourth, even though we believe the pledges, commitments, the governments will uh, carry forward, we want to see in the energy sector, monitor every year what is happening in the energy sector in terms of uh, uh, emissions and report and publish it transparent way to the entire world so that everybody knows which government is doing what in the energy sector as far as the, their CO2 emissions are concerned. Let me take you very quickly about these four major demands of the IEA. And in the meantime, I can tell you, uh, as uh, uh, Dave Turk mentioned, we have been talking this uh, around the world and we have received many, many support for our four demands from Asia, from Europe, from Japan and elsewhere. So, we see, even from the negotiators, we see some good chances to be a part of the, uh, the, uh, the text being under negotiation. So, our first demand, how can we see a peak 
in 2020. There are colleagues here who are very experienced and they know that five years for the energy sector is an extremely short period of time. Therefore, we suggest policies, energy policies, with the existing technologies. So you don't need to discover a new technology with the existing ones. And second, without harming the economic growth. We made the election of the policies which do not need new technology and which, does not, which do not harm the economic growth. To bring this INDC CO2 emissions, which are slowing down the uh, uh, emissions, to a peak which we call a bridge scenario. So five policies in our bridge scenario, bridging the commitments, pledges, INDCs, whatever you call them, to a two degrees Celsius world, at least to keep the door open for the future for a, a world where we can reach the, uh, our climate goals. So this bridge. What are our suggestions? First, energy efficiency, especially on the demand side. We are demanding that, for example, the least efficient category of the refrigerators should be phased out and they shouldn't be produced anymore. Or the air conditioning uh, 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 equipments. Or the television sets. There should be agreement, there should be a ban in Paris, perhaps gradually, that the governments and the manufacturers agreed not to produce the least efficient category of the household appliances, which will, in turn, bring a lot of savings on the electricity side and therefore CO2 emissions. The same applies to transportation sector. We are coming up with some suggestions both for cars and trucks, perhaps more, more importantly, because of the lack of standards uh, there, and uh, coming with some suggestions which can be uh, embedded in the text in Paris. Second, coal. The, today, in big chunk of uh, Asia, especially South Asia and East Asia, we are seeing a lot of subcritical inefficient coal-fired power plants being built. Very low efficiency. And to improve the efficiency there, for example, in, in India, it's about 35%. Just two percentage points, bring you 37 and today, if you go to market, you can buy 45% without any problem. But just being 35, 37, this two percentage point efficiency improvement in uh, Asia, the savings from there is equal to the savings of the US commitment at, altogether for entire energy sector. So just two percentage point efficiency improvement there. Therefore, we are asking banning of building new inefficient coal-fired power plants. Third, renewables. More today, renewables investment about 270 billion US dollar. More uh, to put the incentives there for more renewable investments. Fourth, methane. Methane is also a very powerful gas. And there are many colleagues from oil and gas companies here. They know it very well. During the production of oil and gas, some parts of methane escapes the atmosphere. And the big chunk of it can be easily, technologically, very easily minimized, if not nullified. What does it need to do that? Two things. One, government regulation. And two, some additional investment from the company's side. And we have calculated how much additional investment is the big chunk for the uh, companies. I can tell you, this is nothing. Oil and gas companies today invest for the upstream sector globally, worldwide, about 600 billion US dollar, roughly. And the additional investment to minimize or nullify the methane emissions brings additional investments less than additional 1%. Nothing. But regulations are missing today, and we would like to see in Paris this demand to be uh, made. And finally, 
subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies. Today, we have more than 500 billion US dollar subsidies on the consumption of gas, coal, oil products for fossil fuels, make them very, very cheap, especially in emerging countries, which gives an incentive for their wasteful consumption and blocks the way for the clean energy technologies. The carbon price, carbon tax is a very highly debated issue in many parts of the uh, world. But let me tell you, this 500 billion US dollar means translated in the, in the uh, plain man language, it means it is an incentive of $120 per ton of CO2 to emit uh, emissions, CO2 emissions. You give an incentive, carbon price, carbon tax, to give a punishment, so give a disincentive to use coal, oil, and gas. And this subsidies is a giving an incentive to the people, please use more uh, coal, please use more oil, and please use more uh, gas, to give an incentive there because the price is so cheap, much cheaper than their real economic value. And this has also many other negative effects of those countries, ranging from their efficiency to their budget of the uh, governments and others. And this is another area that we are asking for a push in uh, Paris. And it is also a discussion for the G20 leaders meeting in Turkey this uh, year. So these are five suggestions to be able to see that the emissions do peak in 2020. And once again, they just need some policies put in place rather than expecting some technologies will come and save the world. And they do not, these policies, they do not harm the economic growth. And many countries are already discussing these issues. And we have this, we have made this uh, country by country, which country can do what kind of, out of these five policies, and uh, without harming the economic growth, you may want to look at our report, uh, which is again in our website, uh, what we suggest for other governments. So this was our first demand from Paris. Peak emissions 2020 and put the right energy policies in place. Second, five-year revision. Why do we need a five-year revision? Let me explain you. There are two reasons. First, again, since many colleagues <coughs> come from the energy sector today, this is a concept called carbon budget. What does it mean? It means the following. Mother Nature gave us, uh, the world, the human beings, a budget. It said, if you want to have a normal life, like you, uh, you have been enjoying since centuries, you have a, a budget of carbon, this gigaton. If you stay, your emissions stay under this level, then you are OK. But if you go beyond that, you may well be in trouble. We have, a, we have received a budget, the Mother Nature. Now, in the last 125 years, by putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, we have already used more than half of that budget during the Industrial Revolution in the Western world and the new emerging countries uh, uh, coming and using a lot of coal. We have already used the, uh, more than half of it. And if we don't change our policies, we will be seeing that that budget will shrink and shrink, and around 2040, we can say goodbye to the, uh, our uh, uh, hopes to see that the, we can live in a planet that we have been enjoying since centuries. Therefore, it is important, we thought, every five years to see where we are in terms of carbon budget to review our situation globally. This is one reason. The second reason is some of the solutions we think today are expensive, may be less expensive in five years of time. When you look at the price, uh, the, the cost of uh, uh, PV, the, the solar, there's a big change there. It may give you a new idea to, uh, to come up with a different uh, pledges, different commitments, different uh, reviews. So this is the second reason why we think every five years they should be uh, reviewed. Third, division. 
two degrees centigrade. This is very good. But what does it mean for the energy sector? It's a rather an abstract uh, target. We would like to see the world leaders, as they did in, uh, in G7 meeting in Germany recently, come up with a target if they are serious so that we know what we are going to do as energy sector. We would like to see, they should tell us, in the year X, emissions will be, need to be reduced by that percent. They did it in, in Hamburg, in, in Germany, very recently. And why it is important? It is important to give a real signal to the investors so that they make investment in, the, in a direction that it will bring money to them. Or they don't make investments in an area that they will lose money because of the changing climate policies. For example, we would need a lot of solar if we want to go to a two degrees uh, uh, centigrade trajectory. We need a lot of solar, but to see that uh, penetration, one needs to see the cost of solar to further to come down. In China, very impressive, last six years, cost of solar went down by a factor of four. Huge. In OECD, worth factor of uh, two, because the, the signal was uh, uh, given. The same for the vehicles. Only in developing Asia, we expect in the next 20 years, 1.5 billion new cars will come in the streets. And what kind of cars they will be? We don't know. Many countries put some efforts for electric cars, but to see that, we have to see the cost of battery to uh, come down. And those things to happen, there is, a di there is a need, if the governments want to do that really, a direction from the governments that we want to decrease the emissions by that percent so that the investors get a signal. And this is our third demand, to get a, from Paris a clear signal, the world wants to is, uh, reduce the emissions by X percent in the year Y. Our fourth and final suggestion is the following. As I said, the energy sector is at the heart of it. And the governments made some uh, commitments, some pledges. And these commitments need to be, every year, to be tracked and measured and the results to be published if they are going in the right direction. Although we trust the, uh, the uh, governments, at least most of them, we would like to see that they are making right progress. And if they are not, everybody should know what is happening in terms of the emissions in the energy sector, different sectors of the emission sectors, the power, transportation, and so on, so that everybody is, uh, have the access to that information. This is our fourth uh, suggestions from Paris. And I am, once again, I can tell you that I am so happy that uh, it has been very, and as uh, Dave mentioned, it has been very uh, warmly uh, welcomed by many, many governments, including the negotiators. So let me finish by uh, saying that these commitments are very good. I expect soon uh, other countries are uh, uh, coming and the, uh, 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 joining the others. They are not solving the problem, but it will be extremely wrong to underestimate them because they are creating a momentum and making important steps for the decarbonization of the energy sector and improving the efficiency of the energy sector. Companies, energy companies, in my view, need to follow what is happening. They may be against the, uh, this, for this, but for their, only for the sake of their businesses, they have to see what is happening on the uh, climate front. As I said, for an oil company, for a gas company, for a coal company, for renewables and everybody, these are affecting the, uh, uh, their businesses. And I am not saying about the forecasts and others, but it is happening now. 
I give the renewables numbers, I give the efficiency numbers, it is uh, happening uh, now and it will happen more in the future. We have, as I said, four uh, demands from COP, from Paris, which will be worked very closely to see them in the outcomes, uh, which is the peak of emissions around, 20, uh, around 2020, a five-year revision to see if we have to make some uh, changes in our uh, commitments. We have to see that a target is given for the energy sector in terms of emission reduction and to track uh, the uh, transition and uh, developments. And as uh, Dave also uh, mentioned, every two years, we have uh, uh, our ministers coming together in Paris this year, only two weeks before the important meetings in Paris. And uh, we are honored uh, that the uh, Secretary Moniz is uh, going to chair that meeting. There will be about, uh, I would guess, 29 IA countries, ministers, energy ministers, ministers from uh, our partner countries, China, uh, India, Brazil, uh, Africa, and uh, Indonesia, and other countries, and several executives of the energy industry We come and discuss. And uh, I have many colleagues here whom I work uh, many, many years, from uh, Adam Szymanski to, uh, to Herman France, and they know me. I am since 21 years in the IEA, a very long time. And I have seen about 10 ministerial meetings. In some of them, uh, I was very junior. I was not allowed to uh, come to the meeting room, but I follow from the, uh, the distance. There is one, there is many things change, but there is one thing change in this meeting. For the first time, we have the climate change as the main agenda item in this ministerial meeting. So think about this, energy ministerial meeting of the IEA, and the climate change is the leading agenda uh, item which I hope will give a good, constructive uh, input for the meeting in Paris and constructive uh, input from the IEA member uh, governments from the uh, energy sector for a solution which is crucial for all of us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Bhante, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, we've got a bunch of time for, for, uh, for discussion. I wanted to start off with something that can engage both you and Dave um, from the perspective of your very strong language uh, on, uh, on energy efficiency and what can be achieved in the, in the agreement uh, in Paris through banning uh, of inefficient appliances and, uh, and other technologies. Uh, I'm just curious, and, and Dave, I know that you work a lot on the sort of clean energy ministerial and other initiatives that do have a lot of appliance efficiency, sector efficiency initiatives. In practice, how would that look, right? So you've got all of these high-level objectives that are, are stated within the context of the negotiations that you have to translate into practice, right, that governments have to follow or people have to then sort of... Uh, follow up with other concrete action. And as you know very well, the discussion around the, the negotiation themselves is on how legally binding or not those, uh, those particular uh, agreements are. And so from an energy sector perspective and from a government perspective, how would you envision the banning of such uh, energy inefficient uh, appliances and, uh, and technologies? And how, how would that work? How would the phase out work? And then, Dave, do you have any idea how that works in practice? If you wish, I can just give a, a concrete example in, uh, from Europe and perhaps, uh, uh, in fact, a data point. Uh, and uh, they uh, may want to give a U.S. Uh, or broader perspective. So we, in the IEA, we reviewed uh, what happens in different countries and energy sectors every year. And we have this in the uh, reviews and in this committee I mentioned to you, uh, uh, Paul was uh, chairing some time ago, and before that, Doug Hengel, who is also with us, uh, who was also chairing that uh, uh, committee. i give you one number. According to our uh, analysis, in the last 10 years in Europe, the number of electrical appliances television sets, refrigerators, air conditioners, wash machines, increased almost three times per 
household. But household electricity consumption in Europe remain the same. This is exactly for the reason what you said, because Europe banned the least efficient uh, refrigerators, least efficient wash machines, together with the manufacturers. They have an agreement. And if this can be done in a broader way, which can be done, uh, to be honest with you, easily if it's a global move, which, because you will not have the problem of free riders at that respect. And this, uh, this can be definitely put forward, and you will not have a major, if at all, an economic uh, uh, negative implication of that. And we have seen this happening in Europe, and there are examples in China, India, etc. but perhaps David wants to talk about uh, the U.S. example as well. Now, thanks for the question, and the efficiency part of the equation is such an important one. As Fatih's presentation showed, roughly, I think, half of the pie, if you will, of those additional policies that can be put in place to, to get us to the bridge scenario and the peaking that um, Fatih outlined. So I'd say a couple things on this. One, there's certainly a lot of room, and some countries are already doing this within the context of their INDCs, um, pledges, targets, other things. Um, there's a number of modalities to get to there in, um, in a national context. There's a whole lot we're doing in the United States side. We have been doing, we are doing, we will do. Vehicle efficiency is a big one that we focused on. Others have focused on that as well, rightfully so. Um, the appliance efficiency area, basically anything inside of a building is an area that's underappreciated, but the um, GHG benefits are just enormous. We at the Department of Energy, EPA does some of this as well, have been very aggressive in terms of putting out standards that are both um, efficient, reduce GHG, but also do it cost effectively, especially over the life, uh, lifetime. So that's something we're continuing. We're ramping that up even further from the U.S. side of things. Hopefully other countries will do that in their own self-determined way in the structure of the, structure of the agreement. I also think efficiency, um, appliance efficiency, and even broader is one of the areas that's particularly ripe for international collaboration, for sharing best practices, sharing best policies, and having this kind of thing accelerate um, all across the world. So it's not just Europe that's doing something, or the U.S. or China or India. We're sharing that expertise. We're sharing that um, knowledge. There's a number of things in the U.S. that we're doing that is exactly aimed at that. We've got a number of bilateral programs with India, China, among others. We've got several multilateral partnerships. You mentioned the Clean Energy Ministerial. We've got an initiative there called C, the Super Efficient Appliance um, initiative that is doing exactly this kind of collaboration among the largest countries of the world. Um, we launched a new global lighting challenge, which is focused on lighting in particular, which is a very visible area of efficiency improvement. And we've got a literally visible, um, we've got a challenge now on the table as a, um, as a world with China on board, India on board, the U.S. on board, the European Commission on board, to race as quickly as we can to um, sell 10 billion um, high efficient, high quality lighting products as quickly as we can with countries putting in pledges and commitments about how to achieve that and to really accelerate that um, part of it. The G20 is involved here. IPEAK, which is an organization that's underappreciated a lot of times, is a, another place where a lot of these efficiency improvements can be had. May I add something to link to the, again, the companies? Because one of the things I want to do is that companies to, I mean, as much as I can, if I am right, to understand that these things will matter. According to our numbers, in the next 20 years, about one third of the global oil demand growth will come from the trucks in Asia only. And currently, the, the standards, the fuel efficient standards, is almost inexistent there. And both in Paris and the COP20, the truck efficiency standards are under discussion. And if they are implemented, it may well have an implication on the oil demand growth worldwide. And it is the very reason I am saying that the, we all have to, on the oil part, gas part, to follow what is going on. And efficiency is therefore a very important issue. Second, in the United States, we discussed the U.S. is becoming uh, or going towards being the, uh, independent in terms of uh, oil uh, in, in imports and uh, uh, reliance on other uh, countries. This is true, 
but this is mainly credit goes almost exclusively to the uh, shale oil boom, which I think is a half of the story. The other half, because imports have two components. No? One is the, what you produce, the other one what you consume. The other half goes to the success in the, uh, the improvement of the uh, car and trucks efficiency in the United States. Consumption is going down and the production is going up. As a result of that, the, your imports are coming down. So therefore, the success story, it's a success story for the US, definitely we all appreciate. Uh, everybody is uh, envying the United States in Europe and elsewhere. It's a very good success story, but it has two legs. One is the uh, increasing the production. The other one is the decreasing the consumption through efficiency standards. Buddy, it sounds like you might be uh, warning some folks of a new peak oil demand concept that we're seeing a lot of uh, talk about. So, uh, but I want to stay on the um, on the company side for for one moment uh, and ask both of you. So you're 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 explicitly asking oil and gas and fossil-based energy companies and renewable energy companies to be aware of what's happening within the climate negotiations. But on, uh, there's a lot of discussion about asking them to lead within the context of those negotiations, right? So you're offering neighborly advice to the folks um, that are the formal negotiators. Are, do, do you have anything to offer by way of how companies should get involved in terms of what they're putting on the table in terms of overall pledges? And Dave, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you're thinking about how, how uh, companies should be engaging in the, in the talks themselves along those lines. Perhaps I can say two things. First of all, not to be misunderstood, we will still need a lot of investment in oil, a lot of investment in gas. Why? Because when we look at the next 20 years, if we need to three barrels of new production coming uh, uh, to the uh, to the markets, one of them is related to uh, demand growth, which is affected from the climate policy, but two of them is related to the depletion of the existing fields. So one has to, one has to replace the uh, fields which are in, uh, which are in, uh, uh, which are in, uh, in decline. So we will still need oil companies to be there because we will still need for mobility, for everything, oil companies to in invest. So if you think, if anybody thinks that we don't need any more the oil and so on, it's completely wrong as well. So we, we should see the things, uh, put things in the price. In terms of natural gas, I see a, a growing uh, imports of natural gas under any climate uh, uh, policy because natural gas provides a, a very good alternative to coal and also provides a very good uh, marriage to, uh, to renewables in uh, many uh, cases. What I'm trying to say is that a denial of the climate policy, and it will not affect my uh, 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 corporate strategy, may well be on the risky side. This is the message that uh, I wanted to give, and perhaps uh, I'm sure they will uh, say more about this. So two, two thoughts on this. One, um, it's obvious to say, but very important, um, companies are real world actors, right? They're out there in the real world doing things all the time. Um, accordingly, they can have a huge impact if they decide at the corporate leadership level, at the stakeholder, the stake, um, shareholder level, to make different policy decisions, make different directions, both in their near term and, as Fatih stressed, their long term interest in terms of stranded assets and, uh, and otherwise. There's also an important part here um, in that they're real world actors, and so companies stepping up to the plate, um, putting out statements, putting out commitments, especially by the group of companies that's not the sort of vanguard, those companies you expect to say things that are forward leaning on climate um, policy, et cetera. And there's a terrific opportunity before Paris for a number of other companies out there to um, come out and put out statements, put out commitments, not only important in the real world, but I think that impacts the broader debate around climate policy and where our um, country is going from the US political perspective but the world as well. They can have an enormous um, play because they real, are real world actors in terms of the debate that's going on and, and view these issues less ideologically and more pragmatically. The other thing I'd say is um, there are a lot of opportunities for companies to, uh, above and beyond what happens at a regulatory basis from country X, Y, and Z, to step up to the plate in public-private partnerships. 
Fatih mentioned um, upstream oil and gas production, the methane emissions that come from that being one of the top five policies that could get us on this bridge, this peaking tra trajectory. There's a new partnership that we launched last year at the Climate Summit um, with seven companies, major companies, oil and gas companies, to do exactly that, to commit to reducing their oil and gas uh, methane emissions in the production, the upstream side, have some monitoring. The Environmental Defense Fund, among others, is involved in this as well from the Environmental Integrity. Hopefully more and more companies will join on to efforts like that and to frankly get ahead of the curve. I've got a bunch of other questions, but I'd like to get the audience involved. So if you've got a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, uh, state your name and affiliation, and then your question in the form of a question. We'll start with Ambassador Kozlerich. Okay, I'm going to in threes, uh, because that helps us get through a little more quickly. But he's very good at answering them. In uh, Rich Kozlerich from George Mason University. Uh, one source of energy you didn't mention was nuclear, and I wonder where you see that fitting in. Jan Mayer's resources for the future. In your energy efficiency analysis, there are a whole bunch of ideas which are not economically attractive using a commercial interest rate. What, how did you sort out which were attractive economically versus not? Thanks, Michelle Melton, CSIS Energy Program. I, I really appreciate this, and I, I did read the report. It's excellent. Thank you very much for all the clearly hard work that went into it. Um, I'm really interested in the five solutions that you put forward. A lot of them are um, presumably going to be in the form of mandates. And I was wondering what, if any, modeling work IEA has done on market-based solutions, if you could just speak a little bit about that and where you see that fitting in here. Thank you. Let me start with uh, nuclear power. Why, uh, why I didn't mention nuclear is that the time period we are talking about is a very short period of time. So uh, uh, whereas the, if we decide on a nuclear power plant building today, it will take a long time that we see the production uh, will come through. However, I believe nuclear can play a critical role, a very positive role in terms of reducing the CO2 emissions. But we see some challenges today. Today there are 72 nuclear power plants under construction and about half of them is in China. And other half is the all other countries uh, put uh, uh, together. And the main problem in my view is in Europe. Uh, Dave uh, kindly mentioned that I was in Slovakia, I was in a meeting with the, all the uh, European uh, colleagues uh, there. There is one question about Europe that I cannot solve. In fact, there are many, but about energy one. <laughs> this is the following. Current European electricity generation, 30% comes from coal and 30% comes from uh, nuclear, 60%. And the current, uh, the general European policy is to say no to both of them. How are we in Europe going to replace them with what and when? That I don't know. And I think it's a very plain question. And I, it is a, uh, for me, it's a very obvious question. What will be the implications of replacing them in terms of the economic growth, in terms of the reliance on other uh, countries, in terms of CO2 emissions is an important uh, question. How did we choose our efficiency policies? You are right, there are millions of efficiency policies, but since we said that we pick up the ones which doesn't harm the economic growth, we have chosen the ones whose payback periods is less than five years. We put a limit. So there are some efficiency policies which come very, very long uh, uh, time, they will pay back. But this the additional investments you make. For example, there are two refrigerators. One is $10, the other one is $15, but $15 is more efficient but in the beginning, you pay a bit more. But if it pays through the lower electricity bills in within five years of time, it is in our uh, basket. So we look at the economic uh, aspects of that. Your questions, uh, again, uh, very right. We talk more about the suggestions we have for Paris is more on government mandates, government standards, and putting there, we uh, can reach them 
just during, uh, during uh, as a result of government decrees, the presidential decrees and so on, but you can go through that through uh, different instruments such as the carbon price. It's another important uh, uh, measure uh, to go through. It will depending on the countries, how are they going to uh, uh, fulfill that? And we have made, if you wish, we made a lot of uh, simulation what kind of carbon price is needed to reach those uh, targets. But in my view, I can tell you, the, uh, Dave mentioned, the, highlighted the, some uh, executives of the oil companies asking for a carbon price from Paris. In my view, I should be very careful. To, to get from Paris an internationally agreed carbon price would be a, a nice surprise. <laughs> so I can put it this way. And I am, I am sure that the CEOs know it much better than me, by the way. Okay. Dave, did you want to pick just, just one thing, quick thing to add on the energy efficiency point. I think this is another area where there's some room for inter international collaboration. We're already trying to do a lot of that. And that in order to get policies adopted at the end of the day through parliaments, accepted by publics, accepted by companies, you do, you've got to do the cost-benefit analysis. You've got to have the rigorous analysis that undergirds all of that. And we spend a lot of time um, in the Clean Energy Ministerial and other contexts sharing that expertise, sharing that knowledge, um, both appliance specific but um, broader as well. And that's part of the collaboration space, I think, that's particularly important going forward. Doug Hengel from the German Marshall Fund. Uh, Fatih, a few years back when the IEA put out a report about what it would take to keep to two degrees, in addition to nuclear, you also had a lot of carbon capture. So I'd appreciate a comment on that. And then on, on energy efficiency, uh, there's this so-called rebound effect where, you know, so you have a lot more efficient lighting, but then people just leave the lights on for longer or more of them on, whatever. So how do you factor that into your calculations? Ariel Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Uh, hi, Fatih. Great to see you as always. Um, can you drill down a little bit on the inter intermittency of the renewables and what kind of investment uh, do we need to see? Uh, do the developing countries have the technical capacity as well as the financial resources uh, to smarten their grid? Uh, to go to uh, more, um, um, uh, less intermittent renewable grid. Uh, the second question is about electric cars. You didn't talk much about them. What is the ideal system of incentives? Uh, because the cars are still quite expensive. I saw Bolt quoted at 30,000 after 7,500 tax rebate. Uh, so it's a $37.5,000 car. Uh, on the cheaper side. How do you go to the Chinese market, Indian market, to push for more electric cars? Thank you. Adam, Adam Siegel, Insight Through Analysis. Um, IEA recently came out with a very good study on secondary tertiary benefits from things like efficiencies. How are you including that in your cost benefit analysis? in this policy arena. And also related to the efficiencies, while there are tremendous successes, reality is, for example, we look at Energy Star, there are many programs that took 15, 20, 30 years to actually get the regulatory in, yet these policies are talking about massive changes by 2020. Regulations frequently take a very long time. How are you accounting for that? So I start, I'm sure they uh, will have uh, things to say. Uh, Doc, thank you very much for your question. Yes, CCS is a, a very critical technology because uh, if CCS uh, was to be used uh, it, in a, a significant manner, we have a lot of fossil fuels which are much cheaper than um, many others. We can make uh, use of them, but the problem is, uh, in the absence of CCS, they are expensive. Uh, and when we have CCS, 
uh, when we have a CCS, it brings the cost of electricity up substantially currently, and CCS, in my view, currently doesn't prove, as it stands now, a very attractive area to invest because of the uncertainties in terms of economics and the regulatory uh, issues. The appetite for CCS is uh, rather low. And uh, if we want to see CCS, the important is not to see the CCS in, uh, in Canada or in Belgium, in Norway. It should be in China or India, where the uh, bulk of the coal uh, uh, consumption is. Currently, unfortunately, I see the appetite for CCS in the absence of a carbon price or other regulatory measures uh, to have a, a major share in the energy mixes, the chances are very uh, slim. Even though, once again, a very critical, very important technology. Rebound effect, uh, yes, you are uh, completely right. Uh, if something becomes uh, uh, cheaper, we tend to use it more. Uh, but we have the end effect of the efficiency policies, our uh, numbers here, do consider a certain, uh, a certain uh, part of rebound effect, both in the elect energy electricity sector, in lighting, in the, in the transportation sector. As a result of that, these numbers come uh, out. Arya's question is also very nice to uh, see uh, uh, Arya and we miss each other in, in uh, Bratislava. Uh, now, yes, renewables are intermittent. First of all, I should say something. When we, when, when we talk about renewables, we automatically think of uh, solar and uh, 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 wind. But in the developing world, about half of the renewables growth, if not higher, comes from hydropower. So this is, let's don't forget hydropower. It's an important part of uh, renewables, which is a completely different uh, issue, and the intermittency discussion is a different uh, one there. Yes, the, 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 today the main problem is worldwide we are facing the integration of renewables in the electricity grids and their uh, in implications in terms of the intermittency and also in addition to intermittency there are some other implications in terms of the system, st system stability uh, as well. This is an additional cost to uh, renewables and the I think uh, it is important to see an important backup to renewables, and the systems are uh, made uh, much more uh, uh, stronger in order to uh, the electricity systems in order to uh, be compatible with the higher share of renewables. In the developing world uh, uh, today, uh, when we talk about renewables, a big chunk of it is in decentralized systems. So it means uh, in the uh, locations which get directly the renewable electricity in their homes and in their um, uh, 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 buildings. But uh, the share of renewables in the developing nations is not as big as in the uh, developed nations. So it is a now a risk for the uh, system stability. With the growing uh, share, it may well be a challenge. Smart grids. I don't think that it is the uh, top of the agenda of many uh, developing countries, rightly or wrongly, uh, today. E electric cars, uh, I think the, the, my main, um, what I see is the two main challenges for electric cars. The first, uh, uh, the cost of battery today, this is the main uh, problem, uh, it needs to come down. And the second, from a climate change point of view, uh, what kind of electricity you use, the composition of the electricity. Otherwise, it may not be at the end of the day, not necessarily good news for the uh, climate change if you get 70% uh, of your electricity from uh, coal. So therefore, these are the two uh, uh, challenges. Last question, and the, uh, the, the core benefits. In fact, uh, to be honest with you, we look at, you are right, we look at the, the core benefits of the climate uh, policies but the climate uh, policies also benefit from the other environmental policies. Let me explain what I mean. When I mention that the China coal emissions went down uh, for the first time, it is not, of course, Chinese government is very, very careful and taking a big responsibility to reduce the CO2 emissions, but the main driver of the coal decline was the 
to address the local pollution in the cities. And the climate change was one of the beneficiaries of the local uh, environmental uh, problems. So it goes uh, 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 both uh, ways. And to have an efficient system, in any case, is not a bad news for any country. It is good for the budget, it is good for the environment, both local emissions or uh, CO2 emissions, and good for the energy security, uh, as well as you import less uh, 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 energy. I think these are uh, some of the things that I would like to highlight, and I will pass it to uh, Dave. Yeah, just two, two quick points. One on the CCS, it's something the U.S. government is, um, remains um, very focused on, including internationally. We've got some collaboration with China in particular where we're trying to do large-scale projects, drive down costs, um, um, deal with some of the challenges Fatih laid out. And then on the renewables grid issue, um, I think more and more policymakers, including the energy ministers that we work with, are focused on the grid part of it, especially as renewables numbers get higher and you deal with the inter intermittency problems and all the resilience and other things that you've got to deal with on the grid side. When our energy ministers came together in the Clean Energy Ministerial three weeks ago, 23 largest um, countries of the world, we had 15 of them who joined together in something called the Power Sector um, Challenge, which outlines eight principles of what our grids should look like in the future, um, and then what we need to do respectively to help each other uh, achieve those objectives to deal with the renewables penetration, but all the resilience and other efforts um, as well. So I think there's more and more focus in that area especially as you try to think ahead, not just a few years, but five, ten years, et cetera. Well, we promised to get you out of here on time, and we could spend all day talking about these things. So I'm going to uh, just thank Fatih and Dave for being here. Fatih, once again, we've said it before, but congratulations on your new role. We're very glad that you'll have good colleagues like Paul and Amos and, and Laszlo with you, and uh, and always grateful to know that you'll be coming back again to do another installment of the, the WIO. So if we don't see you before then, um, we will see you in December. Uh, thank you very much, and please join me in thanking Fatih.